What are we fighting for? The best soldiers in the world are the ones who know what they're fighting for. And to make our soldiers the best informed in the world, the War Department has been presenting talks by well-known persons, experts in their various fields of knowledge, before our troops at Army posts throughout the nation. Each Thursday at this time, the Columbia Network picks up one of these talks at some Army post and broadcasts it to troops elsewhere in America and also by short wave to our men overseas. Tonight, we're with the officers and men of Mitchell Field, Long Island. To introduce our speaker of the evening, we present the commanding officer of the post, Colonel Douglas Johnston. Colonel Johnston. Officers and men of Mitchell Field, and to those listening by radio and other Army stations in the United States and overseas, Tonight, we ought to hear an outstanding citizen of these United States, a man who has long stood forth for the prosecution of the war for freedom. He is well known as the publisher of the Louisville Courier-Journal, conductor of the column, What Are We Fighting For?, and as president of New York's Freedom House, his topic tonight is indeed fitting, What We Fight For, Mr. Herbert Agai. Gentlemen, I think that if we teach ourselves exactly why this war had to happen, we will learn at the same time exactly what we are fighting for. We are not in this war merely because we were attacked at Pearl Harbor or because Germany declared war on us a few days later. Pearl Harbor was the last of a series of events all of which had to happen, and all of which proved to us that war was being waged against us as well as against the rest of the decent people in the world. Remember that early in 1941, the American people, through their representatives, adopted overwhelmingly the Lease Land Bill. This was a bill to put us into an undeclared war against Germany. There were a good many politicians in the country at the time who didn't want to admit that fact. But the American people luckily knew what they were doing and knew that they were moving into an undeclared war against Germany. And from that time on, we were spending our money to defeat the Axis in Europe, using our shipyards to repair their war vessels. The war vessels are the enemies of the Axis in Europe and in general doing all that we could do short of shooting. And from that time on, the only argument was how thoroughly America would fight back against her enemies. There was no question about our having chosen sides. We'd chosen sides all right, and there was no question that we knew that we were being attacked. So we are not at war just because somebody dropped a lot of bombs on us at Pearl Harbor. The Axis was doing its best to drag us down long before Pearl Harbor. And we were doing a lot of harm to the Axis long before Pearl Harbor. After conscientious debate, after a really genuine democratic debate, the American people had decided that they were in danger and that they must take sides to save themselves. And why had we come to that decision early in 41, a great many months before Pearl Harbor? I suggest that the answer is this. The American people had taught themselves painfully and against the grain that this war was not an old-fashioned war for land or money, not a war of imperialism, not a war of limited objectives, not a little war inside a civilization in which it is possible to be neutral because no matter who wins, the civilization can go on. We had taught ourselves, and I think we have a right to feel that we did a good job in teaching ourselves, that this was a war of unlimited objectives, a war of neck or nothing, a war against civilization itself, a war in which nobody can be a neutral because the fate of all people everywhere is being decided. We taught ourselves that what is taking place is a worldwide civil war. 
And people who want to be neutral in a worldwide civil war aren't any too bright, because all they're doing is handing over their fate to somebody else to decide whether or not they are to have a chance to have a future. The war, I suggest, gentlemen, is the military phase of this worldwide revolt against civilization. And unless we understand why the revolt is taking place and deal with the causes of that revolt, the revolt will continue after the war. And we will find that the next peace, like the last one, is just another armistice. And that isn't good enough. What do I mean by civilization when I say we've got a worldwide revolt against civilization? What is it that our enemies are revolting against? Civilization, I suggest to you, means a set of rules that people for the most part obey, rules that you and I make and live up to. It means promises that you and I make to one another as members of a community and that for the most part we keep. It means institutions and self-discipline that you and I impose upon each other. These disciplines and these rules and these customs have grown up, we create them out of our national history in order to bring out what is best in man and to suppress what is worst in man. And above all, civilization means some kind of an affirmation about the meaning of life, why we are on this strange and tragic globe that we all inhabit, the meaning of life, an affirmation about it which most of us accept. If the civilization is to be any good, that affirmation has to be good. And in the case of our Western civilization, it is good. The affirmation is that all men are created equal in the eyes of God, that all men have something of the divine spark in them, and that this thing which we have in common, all of us, is far more important than anything which separates man from his neighbor. This is the affirmation on which our world rests. To whatever extent we betray the affirmation to that same extent, we weaken our faith in our civilization and make it possible for ambitious men to lead a revolt against our civilization. And never forget that eight great civilizations have died before ours ever came into being. And on each occasion, the civilization had first begun to lose faith in itself. I suggest that this worldwide revolt against our civilization could not have got underway unless we in the modern world had begun to lose faith in ourselves. Millions of men and women all over the world would not have lent themselves to the purposes of the barbarians who were trying to kill our world unless they had begun to get despairing and cynical about the life which they were leading. Before you can have a Hitler who can get millions of followers or a Mussolini You've got to have people who are willing to listen to that kind of tripe. And you get those people by having a world in which there is a loss of faith in the meaning of civilization itself and the kind of a life that we're leading. What were the roots of this despair and this cynicism? If we can answer that question, we can see to it that after we have beaten our enemies this time, the revolt won't begin all over again. Let me give a few illustrations of the way in which we here in our country have helped to breed this cynicism which has done so much to, to ruin our world. I choose illustrations from our life in America, first because I think that we ought to be more interested in our sins than in the sins of our neighbors, and second because I know that our sins are more important than the sins of anybody else, because we are more important, not because we're better but because Providence gave us the natural resources, Providence gave us the great tradition which made our country the hope of the human race and the most important country. And the same Providence that gave us that good luck gave us the immense burden of having to carry the hopes of mankind, of having to live better than other people. Because if we don't, the whole human race becomes cynical and hopeless. And when that happens, civilization declines. First, as a sign of our sins, let's remember that by the time the people who were in the armed forces of our country in the last war got back home from the war, they found that the country back home had decided to say, we do not care about the pledged word of the United States. We don't care about the fact that twice in the last 18 months we have said we would collaborate with the human race in trying to create a world 
in which you can change the status quo by the life of reason, by intelligence, instead of by the application of pure force. We don't care about that. We want to get back to the delicious pastime of selling each other goods and services. And so far as the honor of our country is concerned, or the pledged word of our country, we are not especially interested. And remember that Woodrow Wilson in 1919 told us, the American people, if you commit this sin, you will break the heart of the human race. And the American people didn't believe him. The American people thought those were just the words of an ex-college professor who didn't know about the facts of life. Well, we don't have to argue that one today. We know that the ex-college professor was right and that the American people were wrong. That it is true that the human race has a heart which can be broken. That people have hopes which, if they are too long deferred, do fester and do turn into cynicism. We know that now. It's a pity we didn't know it in 1919 and 1920. Let me give you another illustration of the way in which this thing has happened. In 1920, at the Republican National Convention, uh, Senator Penrose was asked, what is a good uh, thing with which to fight? What is a good word with which to fight uh, this uh, coming campaign? And he said, the word Americanism, I think, is a good one. And somebody asked him, what does Americanism mean? And Senator Penrose of Pennsylvania said, I'm damned if I know what it means, but I know it means a lot of votes. Here was a man who had been sent back five times to the Senate of the United States. Here was a man who was carrying one of the greatest traditions that any people have ever inherited. And he was cynical and he was stupid and he thought it was smart to say he was damned if he knew what Americanism meant, what the greatest of human traditions meant, and that all he knew it meant was a lot of votes. That is not the way to keep people together believing in the promises they make to one another, believing in their rules, believing in their institutions. Out of that kind of action on our part. I could give you plenty of other illustrations, as you know, and I could give you endless illustrations on the part of other nations than our nations who were being as bad as we were or much worse. But I've explained why I hold my illustrations to our sins. Out of that kind of action on our part and on the part of other peoples, there came this growth of cynicism and nihilism, which made it possible for the barbarian to come back to earth. The barbarian is the man who believes in power for power's sake, and nothing but power for power's sake. Not rules, not promises, not discipline, but just power for power's sake, which means government by terror and by the secret police. I suggest to you that this war had to happen because there are too many barbarians like that loose in the world, too many people who don't believe in an ordered life. And if we see this war in these large terms, we see it in its full dignity and terror and importance. We see that we have two big jobs on our hands, to beat the enemy on the field of battle and to suppress in our own hearts the cynicism, the tendency to underplay our great tradition which has made possible the rise of so formidable a foe. This is a war of ideas. This is the kind of fight we might lose unless we worry about ideas. Not power, but decency. Not money, but real Americanism. The kind Penrose didn't know about, but you and I do. on Long Island, the War Department and CBS, the broadcast the fifth and a series of talks to American soldiers everywhere called What Are We Fighting For? This evening's speaker was Herbert Agar, president of Freedom House, editor of the Louisville Courier Journal and conductor of the column also titled What Are We Fighting For? in the Courier Journal, the newspaper PM and other papers. Next week at the same time, CBS will have its lines in one of our army camps in the south, Camp Claiborne, Louisiana so that you may hear the talk of that famous sergeant of the First World War, Alvin C. York. John Tillman speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.